Dr. Ethel Tungohan, and this is Academic Aunties. When we think about academic relationships, we often think of romantic partnerships between two academics. We might also think about the power relationships between, say, a supervisor and a student, or a dean and a professor. But we often don't think about our research collaborations as an important kind of relationship. That's surprising because research collaborations are arguably the most important relationship that you will ever have in academia. Research collaborations take a lot of work. There are times when they fail spectacularly, and there are times when they work amazingly and actually become the basis for long-lasting friendships. When I was thinking about the best examples of research collaborations, I immediately thought of Yasmin Abulaban and Abigail Bakken. Both of them are fierce, critical, anti-racist, and feminist political scientists who I admire greatly. Yasmin, a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Alberta, in fact, was my postdoc supervisor. Abby, who is a professor in the Department of Social Justice Education at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto, was my internal examiner for my PhD defense. They have co-written numerous articles and published a book, Israel, Palestine, and the Politics of Race, which was published in 2020 and we'll link to in the show notes, and I highly recommend that everyone look up their work. And so, in this episode of Academic Aunties, we check in with Auntie Yassi and Auntie Abby on research partnerships and on the importance of friendship, especially when working on projects that are deeply challenging. Auntie Yassi and Auntie Abby, welcome both of you. How's it going? Oh, thanks so much. It's uh, great to be here, Ethel. And, um, you know, congratulations on this awesome uh, podcast, which I've been listening to since it started. Yeah, thank you for thinking of it and for inviting us. Thank you so much. I'm so happy we're able to make this happen. And just to kind of set the stage for our listeners, Auntie Abby actually took time out of her day. Normally today she's taking care of her grandson. So um, I don't know, will we will we have a cameo appearance? Will we hear like maybe not? <laughs> Maybe, maybe. Uh, we'll see. He's trying. We're we're trying to have him distracted at the end of the house. So we'll see how that goes. Honestly, is it nap time now? It's like noon, right? Or does your grandson still nap? No, nap times as soon as as soon as this is as soon as we're done here, it'll be nap time. So we're scheduled perfectly. So yeah, that's wonderful. So, um, so one thing that we are super super excited to talk to both of you about is this notion of academic research partnerships and academic relationships. Um, it is, after all, the month of February. And one thing that we were talking about was what relationships matter you matter to you the most in terms of your academic career. And when we were brainstorming, we said, you know what? It's your research collaborators. It's your friends. It's people who witness and walk alongside you in this academic journey. And so how did this magic happen? How did it first start? Well, maybe I'll, I'll start and take a crack at this, Abby. Um, and and I'll, I'll preface it by just saying, I mean, it's true that the, uh, you know, the, the research uh, relationships, your colleagues in academe are, are very important. Important um, in in your academic journey, um, and I am someone who's done a lot of collaborative work. I've also done a lot of single authored work, but in all this, I, I would say the partnership with Abby is categorically distinct in terms of its depth and um, its breadth. So, yes, our first article I think came out in two thousand seven or eight, um, but we've been working together for over sixteen years now. And it's also very distinct, though, in terms of how it started, because this is the only uh, collaboration I have had that has had such an uncertain start, um, a start that I wasn't sure would ever <laughs> materialize. <laughs> um, so uh, the story is um, sometime in the 2000s, I say very, very early 2000s. Um, Abby remembers it as more mid 2000s. Neither of us remember the exact year, but I was the one who reached out to Abby. Um, and I didn't know her that well personally, but we had um, a common link and a common co-author in Diva Stasielis, who's a professor at Carleton University, who was someone we were friends with and someone each of us had individually also um, collaborated, collaborated with and written with separately. And I, I, I remember Diva always raving about uh, Abby and the work they were doing on, on domestic workers. So I always had a very positive impression of Abby. Um, and I reached out to her because I was at a moment in my career where I was really wanting to do more work on Israel-Palestine. So I have a lot of interest in political science. But of course, um, that issue was so 
uh, central to my experience and also thinking as a Palestinian Canadian scholar. And, and Abby was a critical scholar. Abby was an anti-racist scholar, a comparative politics specialist who knew um, a, a, about the world. And I, I knew she was really, really smart and I respected her work. I had a feeling or maybe an intuition that maybe I could work with her. And the fact that she's um, Jewish and I'm Palestinian might might maybe be a plus because I was really trying to imagine, like, how could this fraught area be approached in a different way? So I phone Abby to pitch my bro. <laughs> and what happened was she was really, really polite and said, well, you know, maybe in the future we could do something, but I'm very busy. Um, I've got a lot of projects on the go. And so, no. <gasps> Oh, you said no? Okay. I did. I did say no at first. I don't think I was wrong in interpreting this as a decisive no. So on my end, <gasps> I just like literally wrote her off. <laughs> I kind of forgot it ever happened. Um, but then something later happened. So I'll, Abby, you want to fill, a, fill that part in? <laughs> yeah. So um, Yasmin called me. It felt completely out of the blue. I... Um, <laughs> I I recall that I was just overwhelmed. I was approaching a sabbatical mm. where I was at with that sabbatical. You know, Yasmin and I have contested memories of, but I had so many unfinished projects mm. that I couldn't imagine taking on something new. And I also knew I'd heard wonderful things about Yasmin from Diva. And I was really, you know, flattered that she would reach out to me. But I also knew that if I put my toe into academic work around Israel-Palestine, that was a big commitment. Mm. That was a serious commitment, a serious responsibility, and I couldn't do it halfway. I couldn't do it as one of 12 things on my desk. But what Yasmin didn't know is that really almost every day, I kept thinking about, should I do this? Oh. Should I do this? And a year later, I called Yasmin back and said, um, yeah, should we do this? <laughs> What we decided to do was one paper for the Canadian Political Science Association, and we didn't even know if it would be accepted because this was before the race, ethnicity, indigenous people and politics section had been established, which Yasmin and I were later involved in establishing, and that became a better, you know, sort of venue for us. But we decided to write a paper for CPSA. We weren't sure what section to go in. And then Bruce Baum contacted Yasmin to contribute something to a workshop with Charles Mills as the esteemed guest mm. and Charles Mills is the author of the racial mm -hmm. contract. And so we started thinking, do we think we can make the re Israel Palestine story as we want to write it? And we had a lot in common before we started working. We were both, you know, we had done work on critical race. We were feminists. We had a conception of power. We were disciplinary, but interdisciplinary. Um, but I also knew that this was not, you know, I was at Queens university at the time and uh, you know, reasonably senior, but I knew that this was not going to be a great career move. Mm. You know, mm. like if we were going to be doing this work, it was going to have a lot of static electricity mm. around it. Anyway, so we, we, we wrote the paper and it worked, we worked really well on it. And then we presented the paper at the Canadian Political Science Association. And we decided that we unusually, you know, we were, you know, I mean, critical political scientists, but you know, the discipline. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like feminism was not a big thing, mm. you know, so it, I mean, it's more now, but it was not a big thing. So our, our methodology was basically it's got to be at arm's length to be taken seriously. And the closer it gets to yourself, right, the more you are working outside of the realm of traditional power structures. Mm -hmm. Right. But we decided in this presentation that we had to self-identify as Jewish and Palestinian at the outset. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was that was a new approach mm -hmm. for us. Um, and so we named that in the paper. We, we prepared the paper. It, it actually went very, very well. The, you know, Charles Mills was incredibly positive about it. Um, the people in the audience were, you know, our friends and allies, as well as other people who, you know, we'd never met before, who were just saying, finally, somebody's talking about this from the point of view of comparative politics. and and power, but it was emotionally quite a fraught issue mm -hmm. um, as we approached the, the panel. So I'm going to leave that to Yasmin if you want to share something about that first paper. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, th there's an intensity around doing work in this area. Um, it's intense um, because this is point blank 
one of the most fraught areas to cover um, and where you see the real limits mm. of free speech mm. and academic freedom, mm-hmm. even in Canadian universities, U.S. universities, British universities. Yep. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've seen numerous cases around that. And it's also really fraught because um, what you're what what you're dealing with on both sides um, is a lot of trauma and group based harm mm. um, that's that's been experienced. You know, for me to kind of go into that area and have to um, face a, a, a situation, I guess, where people have not really been exposed to or mm-hmm. heard the Palestinian um, perspective that they don't understand. Um, or haven't really um, followed, or they've dehumanized Palestinians to the point where they can only think of them as as terrorists. Mm-hmm. It's a it's it's really um, it, it, it's it's really hard, and it's it, it's 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 traumatic. And mm-hmm. there's you know trauma that uh, that that is intergenerational around this. Mm-hmm. And so, I think this was the first time I and Abby will remember this because we were in this. I, I was staying in a very nice uh, hotel. Oh, this was in Saskatchewan. This was in Saskatchewan, I think. Yeah, we were, uh, and um, I just started weeping. Oh. Um, and that, you know, uh, that is, you know, not not the norm for no. how you approach a conference, but it's a, it's a, it's a heavy, um, it's a heavy weight of denial mm-hmm. of experience. You know, trying to come to terms with um, being able to to speak that um, in a setting and knowing that you can get shut down. It's mm. incredibly difficult. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. So this was, you know, we were, we had, we had, you know, written the paper back and forth, figured out what we were going to say, you know, what you can only do in 15 minutes, yeah. who's going to say what, who's going to go first, what the order was. And just as we were going to present it, and I, I just looked at Yasmin and I said, I said, do you want to do this? We don't have mm. to. We don't, mm-hmm. you know, like this is, you know, we're professionals. We don't, we, we don't have to go there. Mm-hmm. And she said, no, it's okay. Let's, let, let's do it. And I just knew, I mean, for me, it was the first time that I had publicly identified myself, not just as Jewish, but as a serious critic of the state of Israel yeah. that, and, you know, without that, my, the, my, my Jewish identity is unquestionable. It's not anything that I have any issues or doubts or have to account to anyone. But as soon as you say that you're critical of the state of Israel, you know, I came under incredible criticism Mm -hmm. from the wider community. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just knew that at that moment, when we were doing that first paper, this was a really, this is a partnership like none other. Mm -hmm. This was a serious commitment. Um, I mean, every collaboration is is a commitment, you know, and you have to think carefully before you enter into it, but it usually has um, less emotional, um, what can I say, you know, metrics yep. associated with it. Um, this one is full bodied, you know, for sure. Um, anyway, and then the fact that the paper went well, we decided to do another paper. That's, you know, um, the shirt grant came later, the, fir- the book came later, um, the other shirt grant came later, all that stuff. You know, and each time we sort of look at each other and say, are we still doing this? <laughs> it's like, we both have lots of other things that we're doing. It's like, are we, are we still doing? Yeah, I guess we're still doing. Let's whatever. Let's put in the next application. Let's put in the next paper. That's awesome. And I think if I could just kind of go back to these emotionally fraught moments, uh, both of you identified how this is kind of not something you did before, i.e. like this was a project that elicited a lot of emotions and there were a lot of risks involved too in being part of this work and also openly identifying uh, yourselves as being critical um, of the state of Israel, but also bringing in your positionalities and potentially also family histories, right? Um, So I guess, Abby, I really... I'm kind of struck with this moment of checking in right before you were presenting and saying, we don't have to do this. It's okay. Um, And I wonder, what has the role of check-ins been in your research partnership for both of you? Super interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I mean, maybe we can answer that by talking about the book. Mm. Sure. Why don't you start in on that? Should should I start that? Okay. So, so we decided we were going to write this book Mm -hmm. (laughs) that, 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 that we we did we have finished um, uh, Israel Palestine the politics of race and um, you know it came out in 2020 we're we're happy with it but 
um, it was 10 years in the making. Mm. And, uh, and the way we wrote it was by a combination of, you know, conceiving of work that we had already done and adding to it and then also shaping future projects around it. And there was a certain point when we were nearing completion of it. And uh, yes, mean, we, we often would spend sort of writing retreats together. We would like, you know, do we live you? in very different places across two time zones. Yeah, we do writing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, what week can you come to Alberta? What week can you come to Al- Ontario? Oh, I didn't know that. So you we would, haven't seen each other in a year. So you would s- spend time in each other's houses and Absolutely. have writing retreats? Each, certainly each other's cities. Sometimes it was each other's houses. Sometimes, you know, in, in a hotel where the one who lives in that city can get away from their house and just work in the hotel <laughs> and, amazing. you know, um, go, go, to the, go to the gym in between chapters. And <laughs> yeah, no, we do these intense, intense writing retreats, which we've missed during the pandemic. We, we schedule them virtually. But so anyway, so we had one of these ones. We were just finishing up the you know final manuscript. And, and I just did a check-in with Yasmin and I said, you know, I can't stand this book. I just, I hate it. I just, we both come to hate it. We both come to hate it. It's like, oh, yuck. It's like, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't like the way it flows. It doesn't have a good rhythm to it. It feels forced. I think there's too much redundancy in it. And I said, so our goal for the end of this week is to love this book. We have to find a way to love this book. I don't know how that's going to happen. And Yasmin said, yeah, you're right. We got to try to do this. And so Yasmin, we, we each sort of spent some time with the manuscript. And Yasmin said, I think I've got it. And came to see me. And she said, what we need is a preface. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, sure. But what are we going to say? And she said, we're not going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about ourselves. Oh. We're going to talk about our entry point into this book and our relationship and how our collaboration is itself the methodology of the book. That the way in which different identities of being Jewish and Palestinian and feminist and critical race scholars and understanding power is actually not the object of the study, it's the eyes through which we come to this project. And so, um, yeah, so I said that makes a lot of sense. So we just started drafting the preface by situating ourselves in the story. Mm. And, and then gradually we just fell in love with the book. Actually, the story of Israel-Palestine is a beautiful mm-hmm. story. You know, the, 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 the intertwining of histories, the potential for expanding an uh, anti-colonial feminist understand. There's a lot um, in it. And in order to look at the world, you have to look at the whole world. You can't have certain corners of it that you just chop off and say it, it, it's not going to be it's not going to be covered on, under this you know this or my favorite one even amongst political scientists well that's just too political so i am l- loving all of this because i think well, a, a lot of questions right now, you know, I want to ask, but I think I'll, I'll start with political science as a field kind of disavows putting in the personal, right? Like it's not seen as political science. It's seen as journal writing. It's seen as navel gazing. Um, and so one question I have is, you know, would you have been able to pursue this project early in your career? Both of you, did you have to wait until you attained a degree of seniority before pursuing this question? And did you have to wait for the right partner to come by? You know, the, the moment of even being interested in a discipline called political science, this issue was part and parcel of, of my thinking and experience. I would, I, I, I would have written on it. I did write on it before working with Abby, but I wouldn't have written on it in the same way. Uh, you know, I mean, it's incredible that it, it it's worked the way it did. I mean, the 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 phone call to Abby was sort of based on an intuition, <laughs> and I think mm. it was the right intuition. And I think with collaborations, um, what you get out of them is really that what you produce, and even the journey itself, becomes greater than the sum of its mm. parts. And I think, kind of throughout this whole thing. Um, our lives and our families have just gotten irrevocably intermeshed, right? I mm. mean, we've had lots of family meals together. 
um, that we've shared over these years. We've traveled and, and given papers all over. We've, um, as Abby was saying, we've worked pretty much everywhere on planes, on trains, on in different um, offices and different universities and, and in our respective homes. And my son, Zach, um, who, who grew up with, um, you know, Abby around, you know, you know him too, Ethel, but he, he, um, you know, he mm-hmm. thinks of Abby like his cooler mother. He he, he calls Abby his uh, he calls Abby his Jewish godmother. <laughs> like I I was doing work on you know um, the question of Israel Palestine and and what's referred to as the Jewish question, but extracurricularly. Mm-hmm. So you know I've had a long activist life as well as a scholarly life, and so I saw I had a political commitment. Um, to solidarity with Palestine and to to explaining the relationship of, you know, the, the history of intense anti-Semitism of the West and, you know, in terms of my family and, you know, survival um, and the, 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 the challenges of Israel. But I definitely had not thought about that as a scholarly pursuit um, until Yes Means contact with me and and one of the things that we you know we have discussed is you know what's our venue for our work Mm. and we we made a commitment early on that we would try to mainstream our ideas Mm. we would try to go to you know established refereed journals university and recognized refereed publishers we would you know we would try if we fail at that we would consider you know alternative venues but but that's that's been really, really important to what we're trying to do with our ideas. And we've actually found a lot of support, you know, um, certainly like, you know, now looking back when we were first writing to now, we have, we have a wider audience. One thing that I think is incredibly, incredibly fascinating is when both of you were talking about relationship as methodology, right? Um, And that was something both of you talked about when you were hating your book and it allowed you to become in love again with your book. Um, But the funny thing is, when we think about relationships in academia, um, where competition seems to be the norm, where, you know, you're trying to see who has more citations, who has, you know, better uh, metrics when it comes to all of these standards of academic success. Uh, How is relationship as methodology different from competitive academic relationships where competition is the norm? Well, let me just say that I I think there's different ways that um, collaborations can come up, come about. Um, And, you know, I've, you know, Abby is not the only person that I've I've co-authored with and she's co-authored with other people. I think in all those collaborations, which have been successful, there isn't competition. You've got Mm. a shared goal or or shared um, perspective but you know the reason you enter into them um, may be different right I mean I you know I remember being a postdoc and um, doing a project with somebody who was a friend in a different discipline um, just because I thought oh that will be amusing and maybe I'll learn <laughs> something about a different discipline and I'll, I'll grow as an intellectual um, in in other kinds of circumstances uh, you know sometimes you co- collaborate because there's money or there's a a grant to do something of practical policy merit that might improve lives. And then that becomes, you know, kind of the focus and um, in other areas. And I'd say this is with Abby and our work on Israel, Palestine, um, there's a, there's a festering decades long situation of violence and injustice that really ought to be given more attention than it is. And we're, you know, trying quite consciously to make an intervention there, hopefully with the goal of making the world a better place. And that's a very different kind of feeling about it. So Mm -hmm. I think when Abby talks about our our partnership being a methodology, it's also incorporating a sense that we need to intervene in this area and do something in a different way. Yeah, maybe I'll just add to that. I mean, um, yes, traditional academic life, mainstream academic life, the way we live in it, it's so um, patriarchal, colonial, authoritarian, you know. So, I mean, feminist scholarship initially does start to challenge that Mm. a bit. And Yasmin and I both were doing work 
around feminism and uh, anti-racist politics in political science before we got to this issue. The important thing about this project, I think, is that we're dealing with questions of oppression and emancipation at the core. Mm -hmm. Absolutely at the core. You know, um, I mean, Palestine is not a historically occupied territory. It's a currently occupied Mm -hmm. territory. Mm -hmm. The diaspora is continual. The Nakba is not only historical, but present and continual. And issues around Jewishness and Judaism and anti-Semitism are ongoing present day conversations, Mm -hmm. um, you know, within politics and within the Jewish community. So the multiple Jewish communities. So so in 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 the way in which we have framed our approach to this, it it kind of poses the kind of intersectionality Mm -hmm. of the emancipationist act, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, like I see Jewish emancipation as only possible through Palestinian liberation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Palestinian liberation is not up to me. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's up to the Palestinians, but that's very different than those who see Jewish emancipation as just, you know, we have to just have a world only among ourselves. We can't trust anyone else. We can't live with anyone else. There's 2000 year history you know, of danger, and therefore we need a state that is exclusivist. I mean, that's a completely different project. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, think, I think if we can get to that conversation, there are lessons mm-hmm. that are not just unique to these populations. There are lessons about power mm-hmm. and, and about solidarity, you know. So, um, I mean, I, I think there's, there's a way in which Yasmin and I approach each other around this work where there's a lot of things. I mean, we have disagreements and so on and so forth the way any collaboration does, but we often like in terms of sort of ethics, values, basic orientation, we finish each other's sentences, even if we haven't seen each other for months like the, <laughs> that. And I think that's because of the methodology. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that I also was wondering, so you mentioned disagreements. Let's talk about the rhythms of work and partnerships, right? Um, do you both have the same work style? I mean, what, how do you work together? Do you kind of co-write together in your writing retreat and you kind of have pauses and you bounce ideas off of each other? Like how, how does this, how does the, how does the mechanics of work work? (laughs) I think the mechanics in um, different kinds of collaborations work differently. You know, people are different. So no collaboration you have is going to be exactly the same because even if you're the same you're working with somebody else and their style may be um different than 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 yours is the way they think about things may be different than you the way that they process or want to write about things may be may be different um so and i think for abby and i because it's been over so many years and so many things happen because life happens um probably you know what we were doing in one phase might be different than another phase and by definition it's been different during the pandemic we'd sort of taken to having a lot of <laughs> breakfasts breakfast together uh where we're where we're working out what we're what we're going to do we have time where we um write separately and and come together and share things um and but there's also times where we're explicitly together and we try and organize a period where we're together and we can uh we can uh work things out and and debate things I remember one plane trip we had, we were coming back from Cyprus. Do you remember this, Abby? It was such a long flight. And I think we were both really jet lagged, but nonetheless, we just like, we stayed up and we were um, talking and we were working out, you know, like sketches for stuff that we wanted to do. On the plane? Or on the plane. We were sitting next to each other. We, we were. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> we do have a basic um, um, sort of routine that works for us but it's not very pleasant oh. which is that we 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 decide <laughs> on something that we we've agreed to do you know like sometimes we we get a lot of invitations now um so you know we have to decide on whether we're going to do the invitation or not and then so we have a deadline and it's usually months away and so on and then um and then the deadline starts approaching and we usually contact each other and feel awful. Like, how are we? What did we do? Why did we ever agree to this? And then sometimes I'll say, Yasmin, you know, this was yours. And Yasmin will say, you know, this was yours. And, you know, like one of us will sort of will, you know, try to take responsibility. There's the guilty party. And it's like, 
you know, it's like, oh my God, I don't know how this is going to happen. And then, and then we just, we kill ourselves working <laughs> to a deadline. Like it's always, it always feels, it's like, oh my God, let's never do this again. And it works and we get a piece out. And it's like, we recently wrote a piece for a, a workshop for a special journal and we were so stressed about the deadline. And it turned out that our piece was the first what? one <laughs> of like, you know, t- 12 papers that were due in. Yeah. And, and we had an editor that was sort of like, you know, praising us for getting it done ahead of time. And I said, yes, mean, we got it done ahead of time. This never <laughs> I know. happens, right? You know, it was, it was amazing. Um, the way to put it is just in time production is what we engage in. <laughs> we just do a lot production. of that. We do it. a lot. Yeah, we do a lot of that where it was kind of like, okay, we're up against the wall. <laughs> And then, and then, and, you know, we feel like we're cutting corners and it's not as good as it should be. And then, you know, we, 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 we always make an outline. We decide, you know, page lengths and who's going to do what section first. And then we trade the sections and then we, you know, edit each other's sections. And, and by the time we finish any of our work, it is genuinely a hundred percent jointly written. Like we don't do a kind of dialogue piece of, you know, my view versus yes, me. It's, it's it's always bigger than the sum of its parts. It's always, you know, sometimes there's a minor idea that I'll just think about. Um, and Yasmin will say, oh, that's it. That's what we have to call the chapter, you know, or similarly, like Yasmin will have a formulation that goes back and forth in some type of an email thing. And I say, that's it. You've got it. We're going to hang on to that. And we, we, we do have a, a joint um, file on sync.com that we keep we have like you know so we file each other's work and we we're looking at each other's ideas all the time and yasmin says it's a really good form of surveillance because she can always see what i'm working on on a, on a piece um but we we have this phenomenon of like setting deadlines promising ourselves we're going to have lots of time to get to it and then by the time we actually get to it just just sweating buckets to to make it to the deadline and then being surprised that it actually kind of works. I don't know, Yasmin, if we'll ever be able to get out no, of that. I think That's... like every once in a while I say, not this year, we're not going to do this. I'm not going to do a conference. And then somehow I end up, you know, uh, we end up in the same situation. So guilty, kinda, guilty. That was that. That last one was mine. It, it, it's <laughs> kind of just um, what it is, but it's been it's been wonderful. And I actually, you know, can't imagine um, my academic career without having had this partnership. Oh, I really can't. I mean, it's been um, you know a real a real highlight, and I've had lots of great things in my you know, in my, my years as a political scientist. Um, but this, this partnership has, has been, um, you know, it's, 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 it's profoundly important to me. And ditto. And can I also just say, watch out, we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got, we got, we, we've just done the warm up. I love this. <laughs> so. As you know, the audience of academic aunties, um, I mean, it's a lot of people who are, you know, early career scholars, junior scholars. Um, and, uh, you know, one question that uh, I wanted to raise was concretely, how do you know if a research partnership's not working? So maybe I'll just say that that's where the check in thing becomes really important. Mm. Um, you know, not necessarily checking in with someone else, but checking in with yourself. Okay. And, um, uh, but, but the key thing, I, I know, I, I mean, Yasmin was speaking about how she's had many relations, many collaborations. So have I, and, and they've all been, uh, very rich, um, and very fulfilling, but I am really super cautious before making a commitment mm. to work collectively with someone. Um, like it, 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 it's, it's much easier to say no at the beginning stages saying, sorry, I'm busy or something like that than it is once you get a commitment. And then I think the key thing is just always having a sense of, you know, when the project is over, like, you know, finishing the article or finishing the shirt grant or, fin- you know, like, um, but, but I, I, I do think that question of gut check mm. It isn't necessarily like a checklist that's intellectual or anything. It's you, you, you've got to keep in touch with how you how you feel about the work. Mm. I mean, 
so so much of our work is so hard you know it really is hard to be a scholar to be an active academic to be a teacher to do the work that you have to do it's very hard and so you i my approach is i i try to think of my research as oxygen Mm. Mm. it has to be something that comes in and and makes you feel good about like that's why we get into this Mm. is why we do this and and so it's just important to to do that kind of okay am i getting more out of this for me than i'm putting out Mm. um and 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 to be honest about that the, and I, you know, I think the only um, other things I'd add is that um, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in the value of direct communication. I know that can be hard for some people to do, depending on power dynamics as well as personality. It also can be very hard for some people to listen to. But if you're in a collaboration that's not working, um, you should try and communicate. If it is still not solvable after communication, um, you do have to be willing to to lose something. I mean, sometimes mm. that means, um, you know, foregoing a publication or, or mm. letting other people move on with it. Sometimes it means returning hard-won grant money um, or leaving it for others to keep that money. Sometimes it means just reclaiming the direction you want to go in, especially if at, at early stages of your career. Those are very, like like hard choices to have to make and mm-hmm. people don't want to experience them. But I, I think with the perspective of time, you can see that, um, y- you know, sometimes you just do need to let go of, 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 a, of a collaboration or something that's not going somewhere. Um, and that um, you learn something from that as well. You usually learn something and, and it's not, it doesn't mean it's the end of your, uh, of your career. If you end up, if you have that kind of a situation. So, so I, I think um, kind of having a perspective that doesn't catastrophize these sorts of things is, is helpful um, to having a, a fulfilling um, career. Final question, if I may. Um, so Academic Antis is also a podcast about friendship. And in some ways, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that it's important to form these dissident friendships, these communities of care in order to survive in this cutthroat world. And so um, I guess one question, my final question for both of you is this is at odds with how most of academia operates, right? We've also heard studies where uh, some people say, dismiss uh, co-written pieces as being really easy, right? They're like, oh, that's just a co-written piece. It it shouldn't count as much, right? Because you're just, it's, you know, clearly you're just not putting in as much effort. Um, What would you say to kind of refute these sentiments, given that both of you have had partnerships and co-written pieces, not just with each other, but with other people as well? And why should we pursue research partnerships? Because I think some people are shying away from these research partnerships because they're afraid of these, quite frankly, sexist you know, mindsets. I would say, and especially because you are, you know, your audience is is diverse and there are different career stages that there there is a reality that in the social sciences and humanities, the single authored article or book um, is by the, you know, so-called genius professor is valued. And if you only do collaborations, there's a risk because um, when you go up for promotion or, or, or tenure or other kinds of things along the way, there may be some people who say, yeah, but did they, who, what did they really do in that? There's like three mm. authors on there. How do we know what they did? Um, and it's a little bit akin, in the sci- akin to in the sciences. It's the person with the lab that kind of gets you know, all the credits. So, so I think it's good for people to be aware of that. Um, dynamic Mm -hmm. and, you know, to balance things because it's strategic, I would say, but also it can be refreshing to sort of balance things. So, you know, because we, I mean, we've talked about this, the intensity of the work I have with Abby, you know, sometimes a space away and doing something else Mm -hmm. can be regenerative, Mm. right? So, so that I don't think that, you know, the single authored things are, are necessarily a, a bad thing um, in, in the overall scheme of things. Um, but I do think friendships are important. So whether you're working on something single authored or collaborative, um, you know, having, having friendships is just part of, um, I think having, you know, having um, a good life and having a, a kind of support network um, is, is part of um, having a joyful 
uh, life. And it's actually, I mean, there's a lot of studies saying it's part of your longevity mm. too. I mean, I've been incredibly lucky in my my collaboration with, with Abby that we are friends and that we do support each other and we support each other through some really challenging um, situations, um, both in the work that we're doing and, and in our lives and, and things that are going on. Yeah, this is... Um... Yeah, this is a really important um, question and a, an important reflection to think about. My my grandson is playing the xylophone. I'm sorry. Oh, it's so if, cute. If it's you know what? We're not going to cut that. It's too much really noise? cute. It adds humanity to the okay. <laughs> okay. life happens, right? Okay. We're not going to. I thought okay. it was nice. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I, I could go down and no, try no, no, to no, no, deal no, with please. it. But we'll, okay, we'll let it go. It's okay, cute. Okay, we'll let it go. It keeps him happy. So um, effective collaborative co-written work is actually much, much harder than writing a single author piece. Um, I mean, Yasmin and I are each other's worst critics. It's like having like a microscopic referee at the earliest stages of your work, you know, because each of us won't put our signature on this unless we agree with every word. Mm. And, um, you know, and understand why the footnote is here and not there. And, you know, whether whether this point is a tangent or not. So, I mean, to my view, um, effective collaborative. I mean, you can't you can't always tell that there's different ways that collaboration works. But when you know, we make a point of saying all of our articles are jointly and equally written. And that that that's really true. And it means the quality of the work that when we decide it's ready to send it off for review, it's, it's of a qualitatively different standard than what I would see with my own eyes mm. had, it not, had it not been something jointly written. So I, I think there is a myth about the assumption of, um, you know, if it's single authored, we know it's always written by you because all of our work gets refereed. Mm-hmm. All of our work gets, we have comments back and forth we have yeah. views of it you know and, so and I even mean, google scholar says you're always standing on the shoulders of giants right so it's a very <laughs> problematic view it's a very problematic view we don't we don't write in a competitive way in in isolation but but the 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 other the other side of that is we all need communities of support mm-hmm. like nobody nobody can write thinking that your audience is just going to be negative and critical and they don't want to hear what you're saying or anything. We need communities of support and an effective friendship can really support that. I mean, it's not, it's not just that I love you to bits. Yes. Mean like, yes, means family has welcomed myself and my partner, my husband into her world. We've had so many opportunities to sort of share moments and times across generations. We've counseled each other Mm -hmm. about parenting and grandparenting and dealing with, you know, sickness and health. We've been through, you know, death and tragedy. I mean, so, um, and, and through all of that, it's like, yes, the language of it, the sort of short formers work life balance, but it's kind of like, if your life isn't enriched through your work, you cannot do the work. You, you, you cannot do work that takes away from life. There's, there's, you know, you, there's kind of a pandemic pedagogy that we have to deal with. We have to know that our students have to be healthy and we have to be healthy. Um, and and there's, no, there's no point in working until it makes you sick or if it makes you sick or if it makes you feel unwell. So, and it works the other way, you know, like, um, I mean, you know, when I was talking about the stuff that we hate about getting to those deadlines, we know on the other side, we're going to feel really good about it. You know? <laughs> so... Um, and I have learned from Yasmin, you know, you have to work hard to play hard. So, yeah, we we, we have fun times, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I love everything about this. Um, I think I actually just wrote that down. Auntie Abby, you cannot do work that takes away from life. And I think what a perfect note to end on. I'll be uh, marinating on this notion of pandemic pedagogy, because I think that's something that I need to remember too. I'll write it on my whiteboard. Um, if listeners want to get in touch with you, Auntie Yassi, Auntie Abby, are you on social media? Yeah, it's at Yasmin Abu Levin. Um, there's no hyphen in the name Abu Levin um, on Twitter, so um, it's just my name, basically. Awesome. So I'm I'm Twitter averse, but I am on Facebook and email, and people can find me easily. So. <laughs> I'm happy to have any, any communication. 
Yasmin and Abby's collaboration isn't merely born out of common research interests, but is also about a shared conviction, based on positionality, personal and family history, and advocacy. It was important for them to do work on Israel and Palestine. Engaging in this kind of collaborative work requires intense trust, checking in, and mutual support, especially given the intensely contested and political nature of this project that might also invoke personal and family trauma. Their collaboration, and really their deep friendship, is incredibly inspiring for those of us who are doing work that is intensely contested and political. In these partnerships, it is important to share the weight of emotion and hand things off to each other. These partnerships work because they are rooted in a relationship of mutual care. And that's Academic Aunties. Before we go, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you who've been tweeting pictures of your Academic Aunties swag. This podcast is a labor of love and we appreciate your support. If you want to find out about all the ways you can help support Academic Aunties, please go to academicaunties.com support for more info. We'd also love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter at, at Academic Auntie. Today's episode of Academic Aunties was hosted by me, Dr. Ethel Tungohan, and produced by myself, Wayne Chu, and Dr. Anisha Nath. Tune in next time when we talk to more Academic Aunties. Until then, take care, be kind to yourself, and don't be an asshole.